Hello, welcome to another virtual program with Maine Historical Society. I'm Kathleen Newman. It is September 16th, 2021, and this is Ghosts of Pineland, a talk with William Berry. Portland resident William Berry is a research historian, book reviewer, editor, and freelance writer. He has been a guest curator for a number of art and historical exhibits, including Women Pioneers in Maine Art, Made in Maine, Michael Waterman, and Rum, Riot, and Reform, Maine and the History of American Drinking. His research and writing specialties are local and regional art, history, and literature. He received a master's in American cultural history from the University of Vermont. After graduation in 1974, he served as curator of research at the Portland Museum of Art until the late 1970s. Presently, he serves as library research assistant for Maine Historical Society. In 2005, he received the Neil Woodside Allen Jr. History Award from MHS, recognizing and honoring outstanding contributions in the field of Maine history. He has been a frequent contributor to periodicals, including Down East, Portland Magazine, Antiques, and Maine History. Thanks so much, Bill, for being here with us this evening. Thank you, Kathleen, and thanks for all that are interested in this. <laughs> Um, an article in the Portland Press Herald of May 1st, 2021, concerning a request to remove a book entitled Freak the Mighty from the shelves of the Scarborough, Maine public school system caught my attention. The book in question used the word retarded and, uh, or retard and was said to perpetuate stereotypes among special needs people. This got me thinking about euphemisms and uh, how little or how much has changed since I took my first full-time adult job at Pineland Hospital and Training Center more than a half century ago. In 1970, I was hired along with several college grads, including Stephen Booth and Susan McCone, who were my classmates at the University of Vermont. We, we were hired as teacher's aides to instruct so-called retarded people, leader special needs clients, and Portland at that time, Pineland at that time was a special a state institution located in Powell near New Gloucester and Gray, uh, including it included individuals of both sexes and all ages. Our assignment under the aegis of the Federal Hospital Improvement Plan, HIP, focused on middle and high school age students. At the time, these individuals were being termed clients instead of patients, though the medical model under the doctors and nurses was still in operation. At its inception in 1908, the, student, the institution was officially known as the main home for the feeble-minded. Inmate was another term utilized early on and people were placed at Pineland by state or town officials through families after a doctor's recommendation. All were examined using a picture test which showed telephones, toilets, and radios. They were also asked who the current president of the United States was. Many of those tested did not have phones or indoor plumbing. And if one said Roosevelt instead of Taft, they failed. Once ensconced, many stayed a lifetime. The individuals were also caught up in the international eugenics scare, which had started that a, a large, which stated that a large number of people in the U.S. were of tainted stock, in other words, genetically unfit to live in society, since they may have a penchant for inbreeding, crime, addiction, and poverty. The idea of isolating such misfits would not only protect them, lighten the burden on families and towns, but would keep them from contaminating the so-called healthy and genetically pure part of the nation. Pineland persisted under the direction of learned men, almost always a medical doctor, throughout the first part of the 20th century. The Pineland campus um, included beautifully mowed lawns, an ever-increasing number of attractive brick buildings, including residential halls for men and women. The clients, subsequently divided it by types of retardation, uh, whose designations had been standardized by the Vassal Burroughs, Dr. Henry Goddard, 1866 to 1957, 
author of The Kalakak Family, published in 1912. And before that, uh, he was a psychologist and director of research at the Vineland, New Jersey Training School for the Feeble-Minded, 1906 to 1921. It was he who coined the word moron, juvenile delinquent, and gifted child. As Stephen T. Murphy uh, points out in his excellent book, Voices of Pineland, Eugenics, Social Reform, and the Legacy of Feeble-Blindedness in Maine, 2011, Goddard used the word, words idiot, imbecile, and moron to revise the classification system, expanded the incidence of mental deficiency by a full percent. One of our man in Vassalboro then wrapped the idea in an excuse me, wrapped the idea of an insidious menace in the respectful scientific language of the era, quantified the so-called condition, transferred it from an ambiguous to a specific invisible. Uh, invisible to detect in, uh, problem. In truth, retardation or failure to learn never had a source. Each child had a different problem, learning or profound physical or mental source, such as hydrocephalia, microcephalia, or others in need of constant custodial or family care. Uh, to those uh, labeled mildly retarded, which might include reading or social problems. In 1922, Kennebec, I mean, excuse me, Kenny Bunkport writer, Kenneth Roberts wrote Why Europe Leaves Home, a widely read book that claimed that Eastern European, Mediterranean, and Jewish immigrants were pouring through the American sea gates and bringing inferior minds. By World War II, isolation of so-called retarded people uh, were joined by sterilization of hospital patients as a matter of course on both sides of the Atlantic. If it was much more upfront among the Nazis and other totalitarian governments, it was no less common in the United States. Though inspected by state legislature, the works at Pineland was seldom questioned by the press or anyone else. In, 19, in the 1970s, the federal government, beginning with Presidents Kennedy and Johnson, mandated several oversight programs relating to the retarded in all states. Our project, as mentioned, included 10 freshly graduated college students. It was called the Hospital Improvement Plan and known as HIP. Right from the start, our fellow state workers labeled us the hippies. Um, most of us were from out of state, no background in the field of childcare or teaching. But most of us, it was our first job, first responsibility and first paycheck. As far as I know, none of us had a preconception about what we were going to do until we were given the tour of Pineland, which was always a lovely on the outside and instantly depressing within. The children we worked with ranged from grade school to high school. Our job was to engage them during the day and after school and determine which were more likely candidates for retesting by professionals, replacement in halfway houses or with their own families. Though our job descriptions were fairly loose, several of us kept day journals and notes on plan books. The young adults and children were overall good to work with, despite a few problems which were quickly reported. And it was really a, a wonderful group of college students, <laughs> of people. Uh, we didn't know each other for the most part before, but we became fast friends. Within a month or so, the entire HIP program was called on the carpet by the Pineland Administration Committee for the state of the state legislature, headed by Louis Jalbert, Mr. Democrat of Lewiston, um, and we were call, told various long-term workers that HIP employees had done nothing but sit around and watch TV. The charge was e easily disputed by our asking for dates and times, as well as honeymoon, excuse me, bus records for off-campus trips with the clients. Though HIP notes proved correct, some of us, including myself, were given additional duties. 
I was assigned to the wood shop. Um, one of my our projects was making state flags, which everyone enjoyed. Uh, our particular challenge, uh, one particular, excuse me, one particularly challenged youngster uh, chose the Texas flag and was proud of his work. We asked if he, if we could uh, fly it outside of Bray Hall and he was given permission by the house personnel. We found a birch staff and set it flying. A day later, we got a call from the administration ordering us to take that damn Cuban flag now. What, what do you mean? We replied, it's a Texas flag. I don't care if the administrator said, it looks like a Cuban flag, take it down. And I had a difficult time trying to explain that to the client, but we worked it out. The traditional staff believed that the hippies were hired to break up Pineland as an institution and send special needs individuals to halfway houses or otherwise introduce them into society. At the time of our hiring, we had no idea that breaking up Pineland was our mission. In retrospect, of course, it was. My fellow workers, John and Sue Lord, did establish a wonderful group home in Durham and places like the Sweetser Children's Home did their best to retool, but many residents missed the safety net when Pineland Hospital and Training Center closed its doors in the 1990s. A number of former Pineland residents from my era met bad fates uh, because of the lack of good alternatives. In a very real way, the liberals said, you're free, while the conservatives said, we don't have to pay for you anymore. So I should add that I left the HIP program in 1971 to pursue my master's in cultural history at EVM and returned shortly thereafter to work at Pineland Psychiatric Hospital under Dr. Saul Niedorf. At that time, um, um, at that time, I career was going to be in the uh, arts and history, but I, I did take up this uh, children's hospital. And in the 80s, I revisited, uh, and then I, I was joined, excuse me, I'm sorry, just this is something here. <laughs> okay. So I worked with Saul for a while and we had an interesting uh, few months. <laughs> uh, then it was on to arts and history. I was a curator at the Portland Museum of Art. Uh, in, the 18, in the 1980s, I revisited Pineland with my research into Malaga Island in Phippsburg, Maine, where at the turn of the 19th century, a pauper settlement was broken up with some of the residents being sent to Pineland. In this research, I was assisted by the amazing John Hoffman, Dr. John Hoffman, who oversaw the Pineland archives. In later years, I helped Dr. Hoffman and historian Herb Adams with the assessment and disposition of archives during the hospital closure and kept tabs on the uh, re uh, reinvention of the camp campus. Without Jack Hoffman's oversight, these valuable social documents might've been lost, not for some sinister reason, but for lack of interest in space. The records are now at the Maine State Archives. Since then, I have watched the transformation of the place into Pineland Farms, a nonprofit farm and business center, uh, which replaced the hospital um, after its closure in 1996. Happily, two solid books, um, Richard Kimball's Pineland Past, The First Hundred Years, and Stephen T. Murphy's um, Voices of Pineland, Eugenic Social Reform and the Legacy of Feeble-Mindedness in Maine, uh, 2011, provide a firm foundation for the history of this place and the people who live there and those who taught and managed the physical plant. On July of 9th, 2021, the Portland Press Herald reported a new chapter when Union College announced the opening of a new technical institute um, of an, for environment, environmental professions in a remodeled Freeport Hall. 
For so for time marches on, even as the little cemetery up the road, once with only numbered markers for the uh, inmates, <laughs> uh, now has the names of Pineland people. It has been repaired and honored, and they are honored. Portland is uh, Pineland is a is great, but never to be forgotten part of Maine's complicated history. Now, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to mm -hmm. to try to answer them. So we are getting, uh, thank you, Bill, um, and we're getting some questions uh, from the audience. Um, so one audience member um, is has a memory of his dad being a pharmaceutical rep um, and going to Pineland Hospital maybe in the 50s or the 60s. Um, and for as a young person, this was kind of eye-opening. There were children there that were, you know, his age, it seemed a little maybe a little scary when he was young, um, but he learned to kind of later have some, I think some respect for what he was seeing in terms of like, you know, that would, sounds like it could be a scary experience for a kid, um, but how, you know, they're asking how quote unquote bad was it there? Ah, oh, that's an interesting question. From the start, <laughs> Um, we were given tours, and they used to give tours to um, to high schools. Um, and, and I thought that it was a little bit like Bedlam, like the 19th century thing where you show off the patients. And uh, I, I didn't like that. Um, and But they did it. And uh, some, of the, some of the patients were really in awful straits. They couldn't keep their clothes on. They messed themselves. Um, other patients who were in, in dire straits. We were not dealing with those patients, um, but we, we dealt with pretty moderately retarded, and and nobody knew what retarded meant then, and they don't now. Um, but kids have had learning problems, had uh, difficulties with. They weren't sure what, but we we tried to figure that out. We tried to, oh, uh, you know. Uh, teach them to read or to do various things. And uh, we found they were very easy to work with. But the uh, the thing you probably saw, the things you saw were pretty pretty horrible. Uh, I mean, we saw that too. We were gassed when we, we first saw some of the, some of the, uh, some of the buildings. And, uh, you know, these people couldn't stay at home and uh, their parents couldn't take care of them. So they, it was a place to, uh, a warehouse really and the, the and it, but it needn't be a warehouse we thought for everybody um some kids were some kids were given tests and uh but they hadn't seen all you know telephone what what is that and, and we retested them and they were not retarded according to the tests of the day the peabody picture test so i i, I don't know does that answer the question i think yeah it was sorry you mute yourself, Um, I think that that's helpful, and what we're seeing some, you know, other comments from the audience, um, like someone, like, like one of the things that's happening tonight, you know, in in your description, and when you when you quote about uh, talking about this place, what other people might have written or said, um, all these different terms that so today we probably wouldn't use the word retarded and so someone's asking like you know at, at a time that might have felt correct and then later you might say mentally challenged but now you might not think that term is correct yeah. someone's asking how do we guarantee like the new terms that we're using aren't considered derogatory and I don't know that we can guarantee that what the terms that we use today or how we would describe a place to like this today, um, that people might not think differently about that 10, 20, 100 years from now. Would you agree? Absolutely. It's sort of a sliding thing. I mean, when you start off with, um, in the old days, uh, feeble-minded and uh, uh, pretty horrendous uh, names and and then the, the, within the within the organization, within the institution, people, kids call themselves low grades or high grades. And they had, a, it was like a prison and uh, they had different names for that. And it was, it's always hurtful. And uh, 
yeah, I mean, I suppose it's special needs. And I'm not sure what they're, they're using now. And I, it, what happened was they threw out the baby with the bathwater. Pineland's gone. And uh, it became something totally different. And Sweetser School and a number of other schools and halfway houses tried to pick up the slack. But a number of kids got thrown out on the street. They ended up with drugs and they ended up dying. A couple died from uh, HIV AIDS. And, uh, you know, I followed it as much as I could. Um, but it was a very um, uh, unsatisfactory situation. Yeah, and I think we're seeing. So go ahead and mute yourself, though. Oh. Um, you know, a couple of people saying they they had family that worked there, um, and they know that the, the people they knew that worked there did the best they could to kind of get rid of that stigma. Mm -hmm. Uh, someone else is saying, you know, the vast majority of the employees did the best that they could to pro you know, provide the right and the mm -hmm. appropriate service. So just like any place else, uh, you know, there are people that approach things differently, that make feel about a place differently, or about the people that are working with differently. Mm -hmm. And that's going to vary from individual to individual and experience to experience. Do you know, um, someone's asking, how much do you think racism and social issues or poverty played into institutionalization at Highland? The, uh, the poverty played a huge role. And uh, other, there were a number of uh, Native Americans there. Uh, a few Black kids, they didn't have much of a Black population. Um, but Native Americans, I think, um, I, I don't know what the statistics were, but we dealt with a number of uh, kids that were uh, um, from either, either tribal or family or situational, uh, but they, they were there and, uh, you know, they were made fun of by some people and uh, we tried to change all that, or we did, of course we didn't, but we tried and we, we did our best and um, I, I think, you know, right. Uh, most people, most of the aides there did very well and were very um, thoughtful. And, uh, but there were some aides that were just not very nice. And, uh, you know, and you, I, in one case, I reported a, a meeting and uh, the person was not fired, but transferred to another building. And, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing, you, you know, what do you do with that? And, uh, uh, I also was in a situation where the kid's tooth was broken. He tried to come up behind me with something and I ducked and he broke his tooth and I advocated, I had to advocate for his tooth to be fixed. And uh, I mean, they said, oh, don't worry about that. <laughs> come on, he broke his tooth. It's a front tooth. You know, we have to do that. And, uh, you know, so you, it was a strange place. And yes, a lot of people did very well and were very kind to the kids, but there were some people that were just, they thought of the kids as uh, dummies. They called them dummies. And they thought of them as lesser than themselves, uh, you know, kind of winter mensch. Um, and they, they were cruel. And uh, it, it, there weren't many, but there were enough to, you know, spoil the, spoil the barrel. And uh, I, you know, it was a very tough time. I, I was much happier working with, art than, <laughs> than kids. <laughs> um, I, I like the kids, but um, you know, if, if you damage a painting, well, you get that fixed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So someone, can you speak at all to uh, people from Malaga Island that were re relocated to Pineland that weren't special needs? Can you talk about that history at all? Yeah, um, I, I got involved with that after when I was uh, working the Portland Museum of Art, and then on my own, I was working actually as an independent uh, a fellow named Horace Morris, who grew up in um, Pitts, or uh, Pitts, <laughs> what, did say? Um, what is it, Pitts, no, I can't say, uh, up in that area, I'm trying to think of it's uh, the town of, um, Near Malaga? yeah, Pitts, Phippsburg, yeah, I'm sorry, geez. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what, whether my brain or my throat, um, he grew up there and he, I worked for him as a sort of a carpenter part-time sometimes. 
And he, he told this story at, uh, he had these lavish lunches. So we, we had to keep telling him, go, we gotta go back to work, Horace. <laughs> and he would pay us for these lunches. Um, and uh, he told us about a little bit about Pineland. And I said, well, tell me more. And he said, well, you're the historian, you find out. And I did. And I went Jack Hoffman again at Pineland. Uh, was a great source, and I did an article for Down East magazine in the 70s. And um, again, we I was involved in saving the Pineland records and the things because I said, you know, you toss these out, they're gone, nobody will know. And uh, he, he said, yes, um, Malaga was uh, a mixed race uh, island. Um, Poverty Island, it was really a poverty island. And there were a lot of Irish there and a lot of, uh, there were a few blacks and a few Indians and a few uh, Portuguese, but they were all poor. And uh, people, it was it was turning into that area, um, was turning into a uh, summer colony area and people going by didn't like the looks of Malaga. And uh, so eventually the state came in and, and uh, basically tore the buildings down, paid for a few, um, that took the kids that they thought were retarded and took them to Pineland. And all the records survived happily. Um, and um, so we could see what they, how they tested and we didn't use names necessarily. We just used what happened. And uh, so yeah, we we uh, we found out that was one of the more exotic um, findings uh, for Pineland. But it was usually little, little families or farm families or something like that who had a kid that wasn't uh, wasn't performing right, and they thought they couldn't take care of him, and the state should. I know someone's commenting that there was a belief, or you know, a long time ago they doctors might discourage parents from taking home a child that had special needs. Do you think that a lot of the residents at, at Pineland that that might have been the case? Am I back on? Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think, you know, there were, there's, there's a whole history that ought to be explored. Um, there was a, 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 Sometimes in, in rural families, and I know this for a fact, it's documented, uh, their children were uh, were born and aborted because they knew they were in bad shape and they weren't gonna function. And I know that, uh, yeah, they, uh, there's more being done on, on uh, sexual history and in Maine and uh, women's history and uh, medical history. And I think that uh, slowly but surely we're getting to understand more of it. It was all hush hush. And, uh, you know, this kid is a problem. Let's send him there. <clears throat> In the 19th century, problem, one problem kid who was, it wasn't a kid, but he was just probably 20s, was sent to an island and they would send food out to him. And then one day they found him dead, you know? So um, <laughs> that's how, how they dealt with it. And, uh, you know, it was, it's rough and uh, very, very rough. But, um, but we also had, I say, leading uh, psychiatrists who were involved with the naming names and making up euphemisms or, um, and those, some of those are still around, you know, gifted child is still around and, and uh, uh, maybe moron isn't, but, uh, uh, I, I think it's important to know this stuff because this stuff can happen again. And uh, it, it, uh, it, it's, it's alarming to see how it happened. And, and as I say, uh, saving the records, John Hoffman and Herb Adams and people, they're, they're now at the state in, in the state archives. So it's- uh, So if people out there were look, wanted to learn more about this to do their own research, where could they go to do that? Uh, they could go to uh, Maine State Archives, or they could go to the Maine Historical Society, which has a lot of material now. And uh, people, uh, also the books that I showed, the uh, Stephen T. Murphy and uh, Richard Kimball. Kimball's book is mostly about the, the physical plant, about um, the buildings and when they came in and that sort of thing and how it grew. 
and uh, Murphy really looked into the um, eugenics problem, uh, so-called, and uh, how people got very panicked about what was happening to America. Oh gosh, these foreigners are coming in. <clears throat> Excuse me, their children, um, you know, are going to take over, and they'll marry our children, and uh, this place will be a rat's nest. And uh, they, they, I mean, the writing is just horrible. I mean, things that Kenneth Roberts said in his book, people that said in newspapers, it just, you, you didn't quote it, but it's pretty awful. And, uh, but it's, should be remembered. It shouldn't be forgotten. Uh, how would you, just in general, when you walk away from this experience, when you look back, was it overall a, a positive experience for you? Or what do you kind of take away from it when you think about your experience there? Yeah, it was a it was a learning experience. Um, I think I think we did a little bit of good and a little bit. We weren't really informed as to what we were supposed to, the, the big plan. We, we, we were told to work with the kids and we did. Um, but then uh, as it went on, um, and uh, Steve Booth, my former wife, stayed on and I got into the arts <laughs> and uh, it, it became a big battle in the newspapers uh, many times and things like that um, and eventually it became so nasty that they just stopped the whole thing and uh, and they didn't really know what to do with the kids and that was a horrible thing and uh, you know people uh, worked very hard at Trying to set up halfway houses and uh, suites or tried to retool places like that. Um, and they were partly successful, but a lot of kids just got thrown to the winds. And uh, it's a, it was to me, it was just an unconscionable situation. They went through the courts and they did all this sort of stuff. But I, I they, it, it's the kids, not the, it's, it was the kids and nobody really was ombudsman for them. Uh, you know, people tried, but I don't think it, um, for some, it didn't matter. I mean, it, it lost. So I want to just um, point out, too, that this program is part of a series on uh, Begin Again, uh, so supporting the content in MHS's exhibit, Begin Again, Reckoning with Intolerance in Maine. So looking at stories and people that have um, typically not been heard, have been pushed to the side. So if you haven't had a chance to visit our exhibit yet, we'd encourage you to come and to, to learn more about stories like these. You can visit us at our uh, Congress Street location in Portland, 489 Congress Street. The museum is open Wednesday through Saturday. Visit mainhistory.org to learn more about how to visit. You can purchase your tickets online ahead of time, which we highly encourage. And from that website, if you're not able to visit us in person, you can also experience the exhibit online. You can see the exhibit in a 2D and a 3D version online. And you can also make reservations if you want to do research in our library. If this is a topic you want to do some research on your own about, we'll recommend coming here to MHS. Our library is also open Wednesday through Saturday, but it's by appointment only. So visit mainhistory.org and you can learn more about our resources here and how you can make an appointment to come visit. Uh, I want to thank everyone so much for joining us, for asking thoughtful questions, for making insightful uh, observations. A lot of people have mentioned their own experiences uh, with, um, with Pineland, either working there or knowing someone who is there. And the other place you can go if you want to share your own story about Maine is My Maine Stories, which is a feature of our online database, Maine Memory Network. So if you visit mainmemory.net, um, if you were someone that worked at Pineland or you know, visited there, you had a family member there, and you'd like to share your part of the story, uh, join us on My Maine Stories. And if you've got another story about Maine, about living and growing up here or visiting here, and you'd like to share it, that's what My Maine Stories is there for. So uh, please, if you're so inclined, uh, we would love you to participate.
Bill, is there anything else that you'd like to say as we close this up? Not, not really. I, I would encourage people to share um, any ideas or information they have and also uh, encourage people to research, do new research, because, well, there are a lot of um, varied opinions of, on things, how things worked and how things, uh, I think things got so political um, and it, it shouldn't have been political. It should have been um, dealing with the kids and uh, uh, different people had their access to grind and, and uh, it, it, it turned out to be a mess. And I, 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 I'm not, you know, that I always, always be sad about that, but some kids turned out very well. And, uh, uh, some kids didn't, and uh, that's the story that I, as I see it. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong too. Who knows? <laughs> well, thank you again for being here and sharing this with us. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I hope we'll see everyone back for another virtual program again. Thanks. Thank you.